Okay, we're online now and we're recording. I'm muting all the people online because there may be background noise if they have a microphone. So if you notice me, mute you if you log in from outside. It's because I want to avoid that background noise. Okay, I don't know. You know, you might have loud pets, loud spouses. Who knows, right? So at any rate, um, um, I want to start just with you guys in, in the classroom here. I have a few people that ask me specific questions, cover some specific stuff. Like there were several people had issues with the, the histogram, you know, that president's histogram, and with that, sh with the three charts, the chart A, chart A, chart B, and chart C. I think, I think you guys, was that in your homework? There were three charts we had to identify whether it a histogram, whether, whether it by no right, that was in your homework. Um, so I'm going to go over that, but I just want to ask if you guys here have specific issues. I know one of you has an issue with SPSS. Anybody else? I don't have a with the assignment. I couldn't find the 20th Oh, 20. Okay. Oh, yeah, President's chart. We had several people that had issues yes. with that. I'm going to bring that. I'm going to start with that, as a matter of fact. Let's start with that because so many people brought that up. And, you know, it's really intended to be kind of an exercise where you get familiar with histograms. It's not intended to be all that confusing. Unfortunately, you know, we've used the same chart, like, for, I, I, I literally updated it for uh, uh, for this class because we got we have a new president that's the oldest one that's ever been elected, uh, oldest inaug inauguration, and uh, uh, so I had to actually lit literally update the thing. Let me just get into the right spot here. Here it is. Okay. Matter of fact, let me see if I got some another way to do this too. Okay, nope. Okay, let's take a look at this histogram. Now, the best way to look at this histogram, I may even have the original Excel file. Let me open it up. This is what I mean. You can work in several windows at the same time. You can watch the presentation at the same time that we work, that you work in Excel and so on and so forth. Open recent. I know I checked it recently. Uh, let's see, here it is. Here's the original Excel file that I was working with. I'm going to reduce it a little bit so I can get the whole thing in here. Okay, so each one of these columns, each one of these bars represents a frequency, a number of precedents that were within that age range. So, for instance, between 40 and 44 years old, there were uh, two presidents. There were none between 35 and 39, right? So there's no bar there, right? There were two that were between 40, 40 and 44. There were seven that were between 45 and 49. There were 13 that were between 50 and 54. You can get that from this table, but you can see it graphically here as well. So the idea here is, is that what you need to do here is you have to look at this range. Sometimes you call it range. Sometimes you call it a bin. So if you hear somebody refer to, uh, well, that value goes into that bin, that means that, for instance, if he's in the bin 50 to 54, he's in this range, in this bar, he's represented. And the height of the bar represents literally the number of subjects, presidents, results, and so on and so forth that are within that range. This could have been BMI, it could have been weight, could have been height, could have been blood pressure, you know, ranges, and so on and so forth. So we know that there were 13 presidents, because we can read it on the uh, right side. This, this is the, If I was going to put a title on the left side here, I would call it frequency. So you can see that this represents 13 presidents that are between 50 and 54. So I'll start with something simple. Where, what's the median age? Where, where would the median president be? Well, let's think about this. How many presidents are there that are listed here? 45. I was just listening to a report on the radio about elections and stuff like that. How many of those presidents were elected? 44, right? What about, what about um, uh, Gerald Ford? Gerald Ford was, was, was replaced, Firo Agnew, as vice president, he was under indictment for some criminal act or something like that. He had to resign as vice president. Uh, Nixon replaced him re replaced him with uh, Gerald Ford. He was approved by the Senate, and he became the vice president. When Nixon resigned, he became the president. He'd never been elected. But didn't matter, no electoral college, no popular vote or anything like that. He was literally became president. He wasn't elected. Now, he, was, he, wasn't, he was in Congress for many years, 
He was the minority whip. That's kind of like the leader of the minority party uh, at that time. So, so he was, you know, pretty much a well-respected politician. But he was kind of a little bit dull. So to, him getting elected, in fact, he was beaten pretty soundly by Carter in set when he ran in 76. But he literally was president for three years, but he never was elected. But anyway, he's in here anyway because he was inaugurated, right? So there's been 45 presidents. Which one is the middle president in terms of age? 23, right, because it happens to be an odd number of presidents. So you got 22, that, he, that, that the 23rd guy, you got 22 younger presidents, 22 older presidents, 44, and the 45th guy. Is, if it were, if, if we'd have a problem if it was 44 presidents, right, because then there is no middle guy. You know, it, normally what you do in that case is that if you want to take an unsophisticated approach, you just average the two middle guys, right, the 22nd and 23rd in that case, right? So in this case, happens to be the 23rd guy, right? So where is the, tw which one of these bins is the 23rd oldest guy? Well, in the first bin is the first, the two youngest presidents, right? In the second bin is the next seven presidents. So between these two bins, we have the nine youngest presidents. If I add in this one, which is 13, 13 and nine is, 20, uh, is 22, right? Right. So the 22nd president is here. Where's the 23rd president? It's going to be in the next bin. Right. He's going to be in the bin 55 to 59. Right. If I count down from the top, one president, who's, which president is that that's over 70? The oldest president at an inauguration ever. Yeah. The current president. Right. Trump. Exactly. Oldest president ever at, 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 at during his, at his inauguration as his first inauguration. So at any rate, so that's one. There's three here, so that would be four presidents. There's uh, seven here, that would be 11 presidents. And there's 12 here, so that would be 23 presidents. So again, you can see that the 23rd youngest and the 23rd oldest, because he's the middle guy, is in the same bin. So it works both ways, whether you count up or count down. Okay, so now, if I asked you, you got 45 presidents. Now, it's not going to come out an even number. You have 45 presidents. Where would you expect the 25th percentile to be, right? That's the lowest quarter. That's why they actually call it the lowest quartile, right? So, so, and that's why you call interquartile range is the two middle quartiles, 25th to the 75th, right? So where would the 25th percentile be? Well, if I take if 44, 45 doesn't divide evenly, right? So I'll take 44. So it would probably be the 11th president, maybe a little bit more because you got that extra guy, right? The 45th guy. So it would be roughly the 11th or 12th president. Well, in this case, let's count up from the bottom to see where the 11th oldest president is going to be. So two, nine, the 11th guy is going to be in this bin here, 50 to 54. Does that make sense? Is that better? Right? So I'm just looking for, you know, if I had all these guys, you know, if I actually had the ages here, you could actually go down the age and say, oh, it's that guy. But that guy is in this column, is in this particular column, with the other presidents that are in that age range. So that's the idea. We just wanted to get, get you guys comfortable with the idea of using the histogram. Now, what about the 75th percentile? 75th percentile is going to be 11 from the top, right? So the 11 from the top, that's one president. That's uh, three presidents, that's four. Six presidents, that's 10. So that 75th quartile guy is in the same bar as it happens. Oh, no, I'm wrong. He's in the next bar, right? 55 to 59. Okay, so 75th percentile, we're counting down a quarter of the number of presidents and up a quarter of the number of presidents. You guys, are you guys okay with that? We're not trying to, I'm not trying, I, I'm not trying to make it any more complicated than that. That's a simple, uh, you can just look at it as simply as that. You also had some questions where it asks you to do Next, you know, next week we're going to get into probability. And the way you calculate probabilities is, is for instance, if I have a coin, if I flip a coin, what's the, what's the probability of getting heads? 50%, right? One, one out of two chances. It's two ways. If I roll a single dice, a single die, actually, right, what's the probability of getting a four? One out of six, right? It's got six sides. It's one out of six, right? So, so, so you have... You, you, you can predict, based on the number of possible outcomes, what any specific single outcome is, right? So 
So we're going to get into that. So this kind of like the couple, the one or two questions in there, which is kind of an introduction into probability, just the first scraping of the surface. And I think we might have asked you, uh, what's the probability that a if you randomly select one of these presidents that they're over 65? How would you do that? Well, how many presidents are there? 45. How many of them are over 65? Four of them. So the probability is four over 65, whatever fraction that comes up to be, right? Probably 0. 0.0. Four, yeah, right, see so this four over 65? Three and, right? So, right, does that make sense? Right, so four, three, and one. There's four presidents that are over 65 out of all 44. So I'm sorry, what are you doing again? Uh, just, just figuring out if I randomly select a president from this group of 45 presidents, randomly just pick one out, what's the probability that that guy that I pick out is going to be over 65. So I, every one of the presidents that I'm choosing randomly, the likelihood of my choosing any president is the same for every one, right? It's one out of 45 for any, any individual president. Well, what's the probability of picking four out of, six, uh, out of the 40? You know, only those specific four. Well, the probability of picking one of those specific four is four of them out of 45. So the probability is 4 divided by 45, or about, I guess, about 9%, 0.09. Okay? Then we, I, I don't even know if, we, if I did this in, the, in, this, in this particular exercise, but then I also might have said something. What's the probability that, that a president, given that a president is over retirement age, that he's also over 70? That's called the conditional probability, right? Because I'm, I'm assigning a condition first to where I'm going to choose my people from. So given that a president is, is of retirement age at inauguration, what would that be in these days? Would have been, let's say, 65 and older, right? Okay. What's the probability that he would be over 70? How many presidents there are over 65? Four. Right? There are four. How many of them are over 70? One. One. So the condition now is, is that selecting from only those four presidents, what's the probability that we picked randomly the one that's over 70 is one out of four or 25%. Okay? Another, this is a simplistic look at this stuff. We're going to get into this stuff some more later on. But that, that's called conditional probability. So we're going, to, we're going to do some interesting stuff with that. You guys online, are you guys okay? Hello from Queens. Yes. Hi, Lou. Okay, good. Excellent. If you have some questions, type them into the chat box. But I think I'm going to hit some of the stuff that people were concerned about. Okay, the next thing that came up quite a bit, and I'm going to go to Blackboard to retrieve it, was that, that, that chart of those various uh, of those various different kinds of distributions. And in fact, you know, now that I think about it, it was a little bit early to introduce that because we didn't really start to talk about we kind of vaguely talked about normal distributions and skewed distributions and so on and so forth right we got into that a little bit right but we're, we're really going to be getting into that much more but so again this first assignment is kind of an introduction into this stuff as well as the first couple of weeks that we've been working on this stuff let me go into our area there Okay, so I'm going to go, let's see, weekly sessions. Uh, actually, I'm going to go into assignments because I think that that's going to be, where is it? Homework assignments. It's going to be easier for me to find that chart. No, I don't see it here. Student test scores. Maybe I didn't give you that, that particular chart here. You know, I'm teaching a couple of, a couple of versions of this course. And I get confused. Sometimes I don't know where I am. You know, I almost went to the other building today. <laughs> I'm not sure even where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, I don't see that chart here. Let me, okay, let me go to one of these other. I want you to see this chart anyway. Maybe if, maybe we have somebody online from that other class, but I think it, it's worth seeing this chart also because it's kind of a little bit of an introduction into uh, uh, normal distributions. Maybe it's in here.
There it is. Okay, so a lot of you guys, this is the first time you're seeing this chart. Okay, so let's take a look at this chart. You have three variables where you've gone in and you've taken sam many samples from a population. You went in and did a, a you sampled a population, maybe 150 people from a population. Chart A may represent blood pressure. Chart B may represent uh, weight. Chart C may represent, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, blood lead levels for children or something like that. Could be anything. And then we create from the results a histogram. Number of people that are within each one of these different ranges. Right. So looking at these bar charts, we know we started to talk about this idea of a normal distribution, a distribution where most of the values tend to be towards the middle, towards the mean. The mean and the median are the same, so it makes it symmetrical. Right. You get a symmetrical distribution and it's bell shaped and so on and so forth. And most of what would put a person in in the low end of it or the high end of it is just chance, you know, because there's a natural you know, natural distribution of some of these kinds of functions. Okay, so for instance, uh, uh, the probability of randomly selecting someone uh, in a population where the mean is 150, the weight mean wave is 150, probability of selecting someone randomly whose weight is 148 is pretty good because it's pretty close to the mean. But the probability of selecting someone who, who's, uh, whose weight is in the same population, whose weight is 130, they're pretty far away from the mean, right? They're, they're an unusually light. So that probability is lower, right? The probability of selecting someone that's 90 pounds might be very, very low. There might be very few people in that population that are that weight or at the other end of a much heavier weight and so on. So the further away from the mean you get, the fewer people. And when you took think about randomly selecting people, the less likely that if you pick someone out at random that they would be far away from the mean, much more likely to be close to the mean. And that's represented by these distributions where you see, you know, this kind of bell-shaped curve. Now, it's not always perfect because these things are, when we do these samples, things are, a lot, a lot of parts of this, a lot, a lot of what we wind up doing with samples is due to chance. We're randomly selecting people. Sometimes we get a representative sample, sometimes not so representative, right? So that's why we like big samples. That's why we, sometimes we're going to be studying the idea of sampling many, many, many times the same population to, to understand how sampling behaves in terms of the, the results that we get. So in this one, I'm taking a look at uh, uh, chart A, taking a look at chart B, and I'm taking a look at very, uh, I'm sorry, chart, the histograms produced from uh, 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 variable C. Okay, so I'm going to give you a hint to start out with. One of these represents a normal variable, right? variables that distrib distributed normally, bell-shaped curve, right? It's not always going to be perfect, right? One of these represents a skewed variable where you got, you got, you got like most of them in one area, but then you got some values that are far away from the mean, right? Far away from the median, right? Uh, that's a skewed variable, a, a skewed distribution. And if you got the values that those few values that are very far away from everything else, if they're on the left side, it's called left or negatively skewed. If they're on the right side, it's right or positively skewed. Because what it does is, is that, for instance, if I had salaries, right? If I, if this was, if this, one of these represented salaries, if I drew it, this is a histogram. Well, then the numbers on the, uh, if the, if the, if the uh, x axis, the horizontal axis represented salaries for individuals, and I took samples, then the high salaries would be on the right side. The low salaries would be on the low side, right? So uh, if I look here, for instance, let's take a look at that bottom one. See, there's a bar over there that's all the way over on the right there, has a bunch of people that are making a lot of money, but most people are making much less, right? That's positively skewed, right skewed. What that does is it pulls the mean to the right. The median stays the same because the median is the middle number. It doesn't change much, right? But the, the, uh, so it's resistant to change. The me mean is not resistant to outliers or extreme values like this. So it's skewed to the right. That's what we call, that's why we call it skewed. We're skewing the median away from the mean, 
the mean away from the median, to the right or to the left, in this case, to the left. So let's take a look at this. Which of these three looks the most like a normal distribution, would you say? Yeah, I agree with you, A, right? Which of these looks like a skewed distribution? B, right? Pretty clear, right? Okay, a lot of people ask me about this stuff. Okay, I, you know why they ask me about it? Because if you look at this, some of these don't look very normal, right? But you don't always get a per, you know, when you're taking a sample, you don't always get a per, you know, a perfect representation. So you really kind of got to put, you know, not look at an individual one, but look in general at these, the results of these various samples from the same population. So here you can tell it's kind of normally distributed. This one clearly is not normally distributed. It's skewed. What direction is it skewed, do you think? To the right. To the right. Right? Because most of the values are here. But then there's a few people over here that are pulling the mean up, right? So we're, we're, when we say it's skewed, like if we, look at, if we look at this one, most of the values are here, right? So they're really where the bulk of the results are. But then there's a few people that, let's say if this was salary, a few people that are pulling the mean up here where this, the median salary, the, the, average, the median salary that everybody's getting is down here. But then the average is all the way up here because these people are pulling it away from the mean. So that's why we call it skewed. It's, it's distorting it to the right, away from where most of the people are, right? So that would be right skewed or positively skewed. Okay, how about this one? Okay, it's not quite a normal distribution, right? There's something funky about this, right? It's got two peaks on it, most of them, right? Those two peaks. What are those peaks called? When you get extreme, when you get the higher values, they're called modes. Like in other words, if they're if if um, uh, 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 if this if I'm getting if I'm consistently getting high values here and high values here, instead of like one peak in the middle and symmetrical, we're getting two peaks like that. That's called bimodal, or multi, something you have more than two peaks. Call it multimodal, but usually you might you might see bimodal. Give me an example where you might see a bimodal distribution. Anybody maybe read something somewhere that might have suggested something that by nature is bimodal. I'll give you a hint. What if I went, if I took the weight, randomly took weights of 100 people, 100 students at Hunter College, and I made a histogram out of the weights? Why might that be bimodal? Why would I have two peaks instead of one peak? Gender differences, right. You'd have one peak for the women and another peak for the men, right? Two averages, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Right? So that's where you might find the bimodal, bimodal distribution, right? So that does come up. So that, that uh, I didn't give you, I, you know, I dropped that question because I, so many people in the other classes were having issues with that. But I'm glad it came up because I wanted you guys to see it also. Hopefully people that uh, watch the recordings will see that as well. Okay. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. I'm for, I didn't put it into the 600 class, 610 class uh, assignments. You guys want me to add it? You don't have enough? <laughs> How's that? You guys online? No? Okay. Uh, all right. Let me see. Let me see what else I wanted to make sure that we covered. Okay. Um, remember, guys, uh, if you guys, if you guys online have questions, let me know because, you know, I definitely want to go over them. The other thing that came up is, is that I know this homework includes a uh, 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 that you produce some statistics using SPSS, some charts and tables using SPSS. How have you guys been uh, doing on that? I know one of you has an issue with SPSS, but are the rest of you okay with that? You, you're getting to that? Okay, that I have to grade manually, so that's why it's taking a while. I, uh, probably Friday night, instead of taking my wife out to the movies, I'll be grading your papers, and I'll be blaming you, but I'll save $15. It's okay. <laughs> So at any rate, the, uh, the uh, you know, I just, I, we belong to this thing called the New York Times Film Club, right? And it, the deal is you pay, I think, 200 bucks. And you, they, they, you get tickets, you get, that's uh, per person. You get tickets to like a dozen movies, right? So actually, it's not a bad deal in terms of going to movies. But the deal is, is that during the course of the year, they might have 20 or 30 movies that are previews. So they send you an email and they say, oh, there's this movie that's going to open next week or the week after, but you get to see a preview of it, right? 
So you don't get to see them all because you got, you know, you only, you know, you only get your 10 or 12 tickets or whatever it is, right, for, for that, for that uh, deal with the Times. But every once in a while, they throw you a premiere, right? So last night, they gave us the opportunity, you know, just use a regular ticket. They don't, you don't pay an extra for it to see a premiere for this movie called Mother. Have you seen the previews for it? Yeah, you know, it's kind of weird, right? It's kind of like it kind of looks a little like Rosemary's Baby or something like that. Like I don't know how you guys are. I'm a little bit older from you guys. That was a big deal in the '70s and stuff like that. So at any rate, uh, so we got previews to this. That preview was at uh, Radio City Music Hall. So it was a tremendous, you know, it's like tremendous auditorium. It's like she's five thousand or something like that. So so uh, we got to sit in a corner, like way in the corner, in the end over there. All the big shots for you know they had they had all sorts of. VIPs and stuff there. Jennifer Lawrence was there. She showed up and she was on stage with the director and stuff like that. They introduced the movie, right? So, so at any rate, this movie is the weirdest, sickest thing you've ever seen. It is. It's a combination of Rosemary's Baby and Twin Peaks and Waiting for Godot and I don't know what the hell else it was, you know. But it was and and some kind of zombie movie. So it was really weird. But but so if you like that kind of stuff, this I think this is going to be a big cult. Hit, you know, but if you don't like those kind of movies, I, I stay away. But at any rate, what got me into what? Why did I start on that? We started talking about S. I was trying to get to SPSS. I don't know why I brought what that came up. Oh, I, I tell you that thing about the movies and stuff and the grading. Don't let me go off on a tangent like that if you, if you can help me. Okay, so at any rate, SPSS, you have an assignment coming up. If you haven't bought it yet, these the computers here. You can borrow a laptop even. I think they have, even have a laptop lending program. I don't know if you can take them out. I think you can. I think the library has one where you can borrow it temporarily or something like that. And they have SPSS on them, along with a lot of other programs as well. If you happen to have a different program, SAS, that you use at work, that you know how to use, you could use that. If you're one of the people that knows a little bit of math, likes a little bit of tinkling with programming and stuff like that, and you want to use R, that's perfectly okay with me if you use it. We're kind of settling on SPSS because I think it's going to be the easiest one for you to learn, you know, because a lot of it is menu driven. You don't have to type in too many commands and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to use. So, yeah, you have, yes. I guess it's Yeah, now I was going to mention that. Did you have any success with that? Did it work okay yeah, for you? Yeah, I used it um, Okay, so we had somebody who had some success with that. One, one, one of the problems, one of the, it, it works fine. Uh, maybe I'll try and, exactly, let me go to. Like you have to get kind of used to it. Yeah. It's kind of a little awkward. Yes. You have to like log in and then it's. Right. Yeah. We're, we're saying you got to log in through CUNY first and stuff. Yeah. 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 Let's see if we can't do that right now. I wonder if I can do that online. Now we're using my computer online to log into virtual desktop. So that people online can see us logging in. I don't know if the, how well this is going to work, but okay, okay. Oh, you have the link downloaded to your laptop. Yeah, let me see. It's on here somewhere. Let me see if I can't find it this way. Virtual, not found. Maybe I can do it this way. Hunter. College. Or is it School of it's CUNY, right? It's not Hunter or, or School of Public Health. It's CUNY Virtual Desktop. Oh, look at that. Suggested. Let's see what comes up. Okay, and I'm doing this to show you that that there's a lot of options here for this first assignment. In the long run, I think it's better for you if you if you you know. I think the somebody was telling me the IBM site is selling it for 35 bucks the base version, right? For this class 610, I think the base version is fine. If you're taking 611, probably you want the standard version. It's an extra 15 bucks or 20 bucks. Yeah, it's $39, I think, on, on the hub.com. Yeah. And it might be $35 or $40 on that. You could just write, you literally Google IBM SPSS student version, and you should be able to get a link to the IBM website. Also, buy it directly from there. Okay, virtual desktop, SPSS. Now, before you use this, you have to install a client. There's instructions on there, how to install. It's kind of like installing Flash. You know, you download it, you run it on your computer and so on. So I've already done that. So the first thing you got, and there's instructions on here. You see right right below there, as a matter of fact, shows you instructions on how to log, how to install it, how to log on to it, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and I'm going to go click on here. And one of the other issues, one of the issues is it's relatively slow because the, the program is really running on a computer at CUNY. You are only using your screen and keyboard. That's the only part of what's going on there on your machine. Okay, now, let's see if the first time in my life I can get this first time. It worked. What do you know? And it looks like they're seeing it online. You're seeing the same thing you would see from at home there. So they're seeing it online as well. So at some point, the uh, start menu is, is going to be just like seeing a, a PC screen. And the start menu is going to come up, and you're going to be able to run SPSS on this machine that's somewhere else, I think. I just got a black screen. That's not a good sign, right? Yeah, you know, it might be because I'm doing this weird thing with the, uh, you know. Right. Yeah, let me let me explain that to them. The problem is, one of the problems is, is that this window that I have there, it did open up. Look at that. One of the problems I have is that this window that we're looking at right now is on a different machine, right? But the files we're working with are on Blackboard, and then we download those files to our desktop, let's say, for instance. But now this desktop is a different desktop. So it can get a little bit, when you go to open a file or save a file, you have to navigate back to your desktop, your, use, your machine, which is here, right, on your machine, and then go to your desktop and then go to the file and open it and then when, and then it'll open and then when you finish working and you go to save it you want to make sure you save it to your machine and not to the server right so it can get a little bit confusing in terms of which machine that you're using it on for us for this assignment it may not make that big a difference because one of the things that you're going to be doing is you're going to be copying and pasting you know a couple of charts and tables into a word document so even if you get it on the wrong spot, you lose your data and your output that you were working with. You, are, you already have gotten what you need from it, right? So it won't be that big a deal. But it can be a little bit confusing. It can be a little bit slow. And if there's, a, if there's a, an interruption into your internet connection, it, it could drop you, right? So occasionally, so whenever you're working on this, if you're doing a lot of important work, save your, you know, save your file. Make sure you know where you save. Try and save it to your own computer not to the server, right? So, but I mean, I encourage you to, it's free, right? So go ahead and use it. Long term, it's going to be much better for you to have it on your machine because trust me, when you're, when, when you're under the gun and you want, to, you, know, you, you want to practice this or you got to get an assignment done, it's going to be a lot more stable on your machine than it's going to be on here. So, but it, you know, it does apparently work and we can even run it on here. You guys okay with that? Okay, let's see. Came through the uh, rabbit hole. If I came through, if I came through my one, one, no, I didn't have a VIP ticket. The the New York Times people were not VIPs. We were we were if we were VIPs, we were lowercase VIPs because we had, we were on an immense line for an hour. It took us getting and security was ridiculous because you know they didn't want anybody stealing a movie and stuff like that. And they were pat, patting everybody down. So it, it took like we're supposed to start at seven thirty. We got a, we took really an hour and a half. We had to get online for to get passes at six o'clock. We didn't get in until 7.30. It didn't start till almost 8.30. By the time the goober schmoozers, the big stars, showed up, you know. So they rigged. But like I said, it, it's, you know, you, you got to, you know, it, it's a very interesting movie. But trust me, if you don't like gore and really weird movies, you, you, you might want to skip this one. So at any rate, so that's an option that you have here with this stuff. So you guys online, do you have any other specific questions? Uh, now, I posted... I think I think you probably might have seen it already. I posted a recording of our uh, of how to do a, um, uh, 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 a data standardization. Okay, um, did you guys see that by any chance? Let me go to back to Blackboard and make sure that's over there in announcements. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so uh, the idea, of the, I, you know, I, it, we, I put the data up for week 1A, but this is an actual run through of how to do this work. I'm going to add a second. I just want to show you what this is all about. And then you can play the, play the video, and I actually run through the actual uh, 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 operation of doing an age adjustments on data. Now, the reason why I wanted you to see this, I'm not specifically going to test you. I won't be included on the test or anything like that. But when we go on in the semester and we start looking at other people's data sets, especially large data sets that the city, Department of Health is uh, maintaining and so on and so forth, you're going to see that very often that they're going to offer the data in several different forms. One of them may just be the raw data. In other words, they do a survey. This is the exact number of people that said this and this and this and this is how many here and so on and so forth. Others of them will say that the data has been standardized. Okay, well, why would they standardize data? What does that mean? Well, for instance, they might standardize it because they know there's a confounding factor that is throwing off, that would throw off your analysis, their analysis or your analysis of the data. For instance, one of the surveys they do is a community health survey, right? What they do is they have a questionnaire for a hundred, for like 8,000 people. They get to answer all these questions about their health and their diet and exercise and so on, smoking status, so on and so forth. And, and they, they survey all these people, they collect all the data. Now they do it randomly, but they got to encourage, they do it all over the phone. So a lot of times it's very difficult to get people to sit still for, you know, you can imagine you get a call, you know, you know there's a survey with a hundred questions on it. You're not going to want, a lot of people are not going to do that, right? Or you're going to ditch it, right? Or you, so there's going to be a selective population that you're going to wind up with. So for instance, let's say they find that the population in New York City is 60% women and 40% men. It isn't, it's closer to even, but not, but there are more women than men, but uh, let's say it's 60%, six, uh, let's say it's 60, uh, 60, 40. And they do the survey and they find that 70% of the respondents were women and 30% were men. Well, now, if you're looking for gender differences in the response, hi, it, it, <laughs> hi, you got, like I said, you guys can come in and, and leave anytime you want. The, the gender, let's say you're looking for some information about gender differences. Problem is now your survey has is un, is weighted towards women. The responses. If you looked at the average uh, number of uh, fresh servings of fresh food a New Yorker eats each day, well, you're going to get a result that's weighted more towards women than it is to the real population, right? So what you can do is you can adjust that. You can you can weight the the uh, responses by men more higher, the higher percentage than the responses by women to even out that unintended. Uh, 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 error in the distribution of the people that responded. That's called data standardization. And you use that to get rid of biases. The bias that we looked at in our particular survey was, uh, was uh, uh, happened to be age. And I just want to show you the data sheet here. Let's see. Let me go back to our sheet here. Okay, like I said, we're recording right now, so all of this will be on, on uh, Blackboard within uh, 24 or 48 hours, as soon as I convert it. Okay, let's see. Do, 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 let's see. Do, do, do. Okay, weekly sessions. So, here we go. Okay, so here is the morbidity from at various age ranges, age-specific morbidity, by cardiovascular disease. How many people died due to cardiovascular disease, heart disease, and so on, in New York City in a particular year? Okay, and this first group here is women. This group here is men. So if I look at this, between 24 and 44, 146 people died out of 1.3 million women uh, uh, from cardiovascular disease. Uh, between 65 and 84, 5,100 died out of this population. Over 85, 6,000 died of cardiovascular disease. 
out of this size population that was in New York, that, that group in New York. Okay, the total population of females that were in this survey, see now if you add these two together, they're not 8 million, right? They're less than 8 million. It's a couple of reasons. One, this is an old survey. New York population has gone up. It's over 8 million now. The other reason is it doesn't include anybody under 25 in this survey. So that's why you might look at the numbers and say, where's everybody else? They're younger, right? They're younger than all of us, I guess, right? So at any rate, lucky them. So at any rate, the uh, if I were to if I were to ask you what rate the people die at in New York City, right? You, well, you'd say see, that's the that's the crude mortality rate. That's the number of deaths divided by the population, right? So let's do that. Okay, that's the percentage of people basically that died in New York City from cardiovascular disease. So that's going to be equal to for women. It's going to be equal to 12,000 and some divided by 2.8 million. And it's going to be 0 0.004, it's a little less than 1% per year, half a percent per year. Oh, but wait a second. Um, uh, you know, that's kind of a hard number to deal with. You know, uh, So what I'm going to do is instead of doing it that way, if I multiply that by 100, let's see, it's a proportion, like 0.25. If I multiply 0.25 by 100, it becomes 25. So 0.25 becomes 25%. So 25% is 25 per 100. That's what percent means, right? So I could add, just multiply it by any number I want. So I'm going to multiply it not by 100. I'm going to do the same thing. 12,000 divided by 2.8 million, except this time I'm going to multiply it by 100,000. Okay, and hit enter. And I get the number 442 because I moved the decimal place over six, uh, five places. What does that mean? It means that the rate of deaths is 442 per 100,000 people, right? How about for men? Well, what do you expect? Do men, uh, men at more risk of cardiovascular disease than women, would you say? Right, you guys have been around the health field a little bit. You'd say yes, right? Well, it's actually measure the, car the uh, rate due to, car due, due to cardiovascular disease for men. It's equal to that times 100,000 again, divided by the population of men, 2.4 million. The number for men is lower. Low, men are dying at a lower rate than women are from cardiovascular disease. That's counterintuitive, right? Something's wrong there. Why do you think that might be? That's the crude mortality rate. Let's take a look at this. Which group is most likely to die from cardiovascular disease here in terms of age? The older group, much more, much, much more at risk. Really, look at so you got six thousand out of 8,700. 8, that, that's compared eighty-seven thousand compared to one hundred forty-six out of one point three million. Much as you get older, much more likely, right? So, problem is age. Look at this. Look at how many older men and um, older women there are compared to older men. This population is uh, uh, women have a much older population distribution. That's why it looks like they're dying at a higher rate than men. It's not really true for the entire population. It's just because there are so many older women and that's what older people die from, right? So we need to correct this to take that age out so we can really see who is at greater risk of cardiovascular disease if they're from the same population. And that's what we do here. We actually create a single population and then use all the rates at which people are dying from each age. We calculate rates for each age group and then use that on the same population, a sample pop, a, a population that's same, use the rates for females, rates for men. So now we're comparing apples and apples instead of apples and oranges. And if you play that video, let me see if it's on, let me make sure it's on there. Let's go to announcements. Okay, there you go. If you play this video, it will take you through this entire exercise. Okay, and later on, I'm going to post, you can watch that video later on. Later on, I'm going to post another data, another spreadsheet, which is going to be uh, 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 the rate of, of, de of death from uh, 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 cancer, from uh, uh, neopl uh, neoplasm, the cancer, for Alaskans versus Floridians, right? So which one do you think is going to have a bigger rate? Right? Well, that's a little issue here, right? Florida's going to have much, it's going to have much bigger rate. You're going to say to yourself, 
gee, maybe there's something in the air in Florida or in the orange juice. They go out of orange juice down there. Maybe, maybe there's something in the orange juice that's causing them to get cancer at a higher rate than people in Alaska. But you know really what's happening is why do we have higher rate of this? Because it's an older population. If you look at the population of Alaska, if you're over 40 in Alaska, you're a relic, right? So you move somewhere warm, right? That's what you do. If you're, so, I mean, that's, that's really what's going on there. Okay.